Next, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you General Larry Spencer, a native of Washington, D.C., who enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1971, just over the uh, Washington, D.C. border in Suitland, Maryland. Spent two terms in the Air Force as an enlisted man, finished his degree, and, it, and it, after 44 years of service to our country, he retired in 2015 as the 30, 37th Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. It is truly my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you General Larry O. Spencer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good, good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you all for, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you all for uh, what you do. And uh, thank you all for uh, your service. Uh, it's really very much appreciated. Uh, first of all, I don't know how many of you know uh, Charles Barkley, a uh, former NBA player. Um, well, Charles Barkley uh, once said that, that he was not a role model, uh, that just because he can dunk a basketball doesn't mean he should raise your kids. Uh, I guess in some, in some respects that's true, uh, but I think he was a little naive in the, in the sense of, you know, he was a role model uh, whether he liked it or not. Um, and so I, I've had a, a role models uh, growing up myself, and uh, a lot of those uh, were my, pa uh, clearly was my parents and, uh, and in the military. Uh, so anyway, what I, really what I want to talk about is really anything you want to talk about. Um, in terms of your service, in terms of my service, in terms of <coughs> how you can, you can best uh, serve your country. So uh, let me start off by saying if there's any questions, any, because I, I do have a couple things I want to cover. So is there anything that you all want to talk about, anything you're interested in? Because uh, I really want to make this productive for you. Anybody have anything on their mind? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, what do you think makes a role model? Oh, good question. Um, a uh, lot of things you've probably heard already. Integrity, um, uh, I think uh, the way you carry yourself, uh, I think the way you interact with other people. Uh, if, you know, the, unfortunately, uh, we're, our country's in a tough place right now, uh, and there's not a lot of role models out there I think that many of you would point your kids to. Uh, you know, we've, we're not very civil with each other anymore, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I think a role model is someone who uh, carries himself uh, in a way that you would want to follow and you'd want your kids to follow. Uh, let me give you an example, because uh, of, of, that's a great question. Uh, when I grew up uh, over in D.C., um, my father was in the, in the, had been in the Army. Uh, he'd served for 20 years. Uh, and my role models, not only with him, but they were veterans uh, that, that I grew up with. So let me tell you about a couple of those. Uh, Sergeant Roy Johnson, which is probably someone you never heard of, uh, he was in the Korean War, and, and he'd only been there for 14 days. So he shows up in Korea. He's only been there two weeks. Uh, and he's pushed, he's pushed into duty as an ambulance driver. So before dawn one morning, uh, he was told to go out to the front line uh, and pick up some, uh, some wounded soldiers. Uh, shortly after he began, uh, he, he came to what he thought was a roadblock. Uh, as the sun began to rise, he realized the roadblock was actually three enemy tanks. Uh, in an attempt to escape, he quickly put his right hand on the stern wheel, his left hand on the gear shift. Uh, and as soon as he put his hand on the steering wheel, uh, he, got, he was attacked by machine gun fire and literally took his left hand off. Uh, he immediately, uh, he, he was knocked out of the vehicle. Uh, in the meantime, a, another ambulance driver showed up behind him. Uh, and according to Sergeant Johnson, uh, this is a quote from him, the driver was completely cut to pieces by machine gun fire. Uh, the attack on Sergeant Johnson knocked him outside the Jeep, so immediately an enemy soldier came up to him. And think, put yourself in his shoes now. You're, you're in Korea, you're on the ground, you've been shot in the hand, you didn't much, essentially don't have much of a hand left, and an enemy soldier comes up to you. The enemy soldier recognized Sergeant Johnson was not dead, 
and pointed his gun at Sergeant Johnson and fired point blank at him three times. Now, Sergeant Johnson instinctively raised his hand to block the shots, if that's possible. Uh, and and as the, as the, as the uh, enemy soldier fired at him, the first bullet entered his shoulder uh, and came out under his armpit, uh, traveling by his heart. Uh, Sergeant Johnson doesn't remember what happened with the other two shots. All he knows is they, they, they apparently missed him. Uh, but now he was laying on the ground with this soldier standing over him, and he can feel blood pooling in his chest. So to this day, again, he can't explain what happened after that. Uh, but the enemy soldier kicked him uh, and figured he was dead uh, and walked away. Uh, Sergeant Johnson, again, using his training, uh, once the soldier left, he gave himself a shot of morphine. He tied a tourniquet around his, his arm. Uh, he went into the other Jeep, pushed the other soldier aside, uh, and drove back to uh, the front lines where they uh, patched him up as best they could. They sent him to Japan, and where he was then subsequently sent to uh, Walter Reed uh, for treatment and recovery. Uh, this is a guy that I grew up around my house. Uh, like Sergeant Johnson, uh, another guy that was in my house almost on a weekly basis, Sergeant Crocker, George Crocker, he also, he's in the Army, he also arrived in Korea about the same time as, as uh, Sergeant Johnson. Uh, and he was also, he was actually uh, one of the, uh, one of the folks that was in the, uh, one, back then, what was, was, an, was an all black infantry unit. The military had not quite been integrated at the time. Uh, although legally they were, technically they were not. Uh, and so Sergeant Crocker was on an, uh, an in, a reconnaissance mission. Uh, when his company came under really heavy fire, he was initially struck in the leg, followed by artillery fire that left shrapnel in his back and in his abdomen. Sergeant Crocker's only memory was there was fire coming from everywhere. Sergeant Crocker passed out. He was unconscious. They took him to a, a hospital, also in Japan. He subsequently ended up uh, at Walter Reed. Uh, Sergeant Alfonso Spencer, who's my father, uh, he was in Korea uh, as a heavy equipment operator. Uh, he was, uh, it, this is actually documented in a book uh, called uh, Road to Yichon, uh, where he was asked to move a bulldozer uh, from one town to where they were to a town called Yichan. Uh, he and another soldier were up on the bulldozer. They came under fire. My father instinctively rolled off of the bulldozer, found himself on the tracks of the bulldozer because it was still moving. He then instinctively twisted himself off the, bull off the track, but his left hand got mauled in the tracks of the bulldozer. Now, back then, now, most of you are probably aware that the military now has very sophisticated uh, and very effective um, uh, tools and, and, and techniques to remove in, injured soldiers and, and injured folks from the battlefield quickly and efficiently. Uh, you've probably heard the term golden hour. I mean, they can really, they can get to you very quickly now. And literally within hours, you can be from somewhere uh, in the, anywhere in the world back to the States in a hospital. Clearly, that was not the case in the early 50s. So my, I don't know how many of you have been to Korea, uh, but in the wintertime, it's, it's called cold Rhea. I mean, it gets cold in Korea. Uh, and he was laying out on the ground with no medical help, no medical support. There was no, none of this evacuation stuff like we have now. Uh, and so as you can imagine, uh, he fell into a coma. He got gangrene in his hand, uh, so by the time they found him, uh, he was also un unconscious. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, I think, is he told me about that experience when he was in a coma, because he grew up on a farm in Virginia, uh, and so he had a dream while he was in this coma that he was chopping down a really big tree, and he, and he was just going to town on this tree with an ax. Uh, and he didn't know why, he didn't understand wh why he was chopping this tree down. All he knows is he had to get this tree down. And he got to a point where he had one more swing of the ax to 
so that the, so the tree would fall over. For whatever reason, he doesn't know why, he decided to sit the ax down and not chop the tree all the way down. And according to him, soon as he, in his dream, soon as he laid the ax on the ground, he came out of his coma. What's interesting is, is that Sergeant Crocker, Sergeant Johnson, and Sergeant Spencer all met together at Walter Reed Hospital. They all arrived around the same time. And they all got to be lifelong friends. And, as, and I, again, I got to grow up uh, around all three of these gentlemen. One of the things Sergeant Crocker uh, tells, and my father as well, is because my father's hand had been amputated, uh, and Sergeant Crocker um, had other ailments, they worked together to the point where uh, my father would push Sergeant Crocker to dinner in his wheelchair, but while they're at the table, Sergeant Crocker would cut the meat for my father because he only had one hand. Uh, but if you, as you can imagine, at least every weekend, uh, these are the folks that I got to be around and got to use as role models and got to uh, grow up with. Um, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant, General Norm Schwarzkopf, I'm sure you've heard of him, he, he said it doesn't take a hero to order men into battle. It takes a hero to be one of those men or women who goes into battle. Uh, I really like that quote because uh, although I retired as a four-star general, uh, I, I spent eight years enlisted uh, before I went to officer training school. Uh, and, and I can tell you that quote is absolutely true. Uh, it's a lot easier sending people off to war than it is actually going to fight. Uh, so I think for all of you, I think that's important to understand. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think sometimes our country understands that. Uh, that it's, it's, it's the, the enlisted force of all of our services that are li literally out there on the front lines as, we, as you sit here today. Uh, there are folks taking fire somewhere uh, around the world uh, for all of us. So I think that's, uh, that's really important um, that we all remember that. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that like Sergeants Crocker, Sergeant Spencer uh, and Sergeant Johnson, uh, they are, in my mind, heroes. Think about putting yourself in their shoes and enduring any of what they endured. And also think about the countless soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen that are just like these three NCOs that until today no one in this room ever heard of those three. Think about the thousands of folks that are out there today that have done what they did and more that you will never hear about. You will never hear their names. They're not on TV. They're not famous. They don't want any recognition. They aren't bragging about what they did. They aren't complaining about what they did. But they are heroes that you all will never know will never get to meet, will never understand what their stories are. Uh, and I think that's really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate for all of us. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate uh, for our country uh, with all the negativity we hear. And, 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 and clearly, I'm not going to get into politics this because there's enough blame to go around, I think, for everybody. But with all the negative stuff we hear every day, I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves, why is nobody talking about these people? Why is nobody talking about these veterans that went out and risked their lives and in some t cases lost their lives so that all of us could have the freedom and the opportunity to do what we all do every day? That is a mystery to me. Um, also, let me, let me uh, talk about one other thing, and then I'll see if you all have any other questions, <clears throat> that I think is really important in your professional growth uh, and in your life as well, uh, that really helps me. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in D.C., uh, southeast, uh, pretty much a city kid. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you to use your imagination just for a second. I hope you all have an imagination because you're going to really need it. 
But if you can picture me back in the 70s uh, in DC, big afro, uh, platform shoes, bell-bottom pants, tie-dye shirt, I mean, I, I was there. My, and my mother used to call me a hippie. Uh, that, that was me. Um, and, and keep in mind, it was Vietnam, it was anti-establishment, you know, uh, um, marches in the street. Uh, it was not popular to wear a uniform at all. In fact, in the Pentagon, they stopped wearing a uniform uh, because of, of the harassment that they would take. Uh, it was a tough time in our country. Uh, in, in addition to the Vietnam, you had a civil rights movement. There was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and for those of you that were around, uh, you know, take someone like me. I was, I was around in D.C. in 1968 where you had, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. There was a lot going on in our country. Um, so, so the first thing I want to say is don't worry so much about, I mean, I am as worried as anybody about where our country is today, so I've got enough worry for you all. But I am, I've been around long enough to have seen our country go through stuff before and come out stronger on the other end. So that's sort of my optimism, that no matter how you feel about where we are today, our country and our people and our Constitution is strong enough to withstand, I think, anything, regardless of where you come down on the political spectrum. I think our country is going to be OK. Um, so even though I was a, a city kid, uh, I was really fortunate to uh, spend some time with my grandfather uh, who lived in southwest Virginia, uh, down not too far from Appomattox. And I would go down there every summer. Uh, and I hated it at the time because I had to work tobacco, I had to get up early. Uh, we didn't have any TV. He had a little black and white TV with uh, a coat hanger on it to, to get, I think, two stations. Uh, and we didn't really watch it much. If we, we watched it twice because my grandfather had two shows he liked to watch. And that's all we got to watch. And one was Lassie. I don't, most of you don't ever heard of that. The other one was Bonanza. And other than that, that, that was it. That's, all, that's what we got to watch. Other than that, we were up in the morning going out, working the tobacco fields. By the way, uh, I don't know if anybody here is from sort of the uh, rural farm areas. If you are, uh, would you help me after this is over? And just come in the back and tell me, because I've been worrying about this my whole life. How does a rooster know it's 5.30 and they crow in the May 5.30? I, I don't, I've never been able to figure that out. But every morning that rooster would crow at 5.30, we'd be up. Uh, how my grandmother on a stove with no, on a wood stove with no, you know, with no regulation, way to regulate the heat, could cook such a great breakfast. She cooked everything. She worked from night, to, from, from sun up to sundown, whether it was feeding chickens, whether it was washing clothes. I mean, she was just all over the place in constant motion. And so one, and the good thing about, though, going down in the summers was my cousin was there, and he was about my same age. And so we, we kind of hung out together and worked tobacco, and we kind of hung out, went fishing and all that. So anyway, one summer, I went down, and my cousin wasn't there. He was up in Philadelphia visiting his mother. So, so he, would, he was going to come down a couple of weeks later, but I didn't know I was going to be there by myself. And my grandfather is sort of an introvert, and I'm sort of an introvert, so we didn't have a whole lot of conversation. We got along OK, but we just didn't have a lot of conversation. And so he decided, uh, since we were alone, that he would start talking to me and start uh, teaching me things. Uh, so for example, he I don't know why, he explained to me he thought it was important for me to understand the difference between a donkey and a mule. I don't know why he thought that was important, but, but he did. So he, he gave me these nuggets of knowledge uh, this summer. And so I started thinking, you know, well, you know, maybe we're getting along now. I really want to figure out ways to impress him. So our, our morning ritual was he had a tractor. He had a platform on the back of the tractor. We'd go out every morning. I'd jump on the back platform. We'd go off to whatever tobacco field we were going to work on. Uh, and, and we would just work until it got too hot, and then we'd come back. So this morning, I, uh, this particular morning, I went out toward the tractor. He says, no, we're not going to do that today. We're going to hitch up the horse. Uh, he only had one horse. It was a really big horse. Um, so I said, OK. So he hitches up this horse. And the horse was pulling the platform with the plow on it. It was great for me. I, I jumped on the platform, had the horse pulling me out. I thought it was great. So we went out to this field. 
and he hitches up this plow and he starts plowing this perfectly, perfect rows in a perfect field. Uh, and it was just absolutely brilliant as far as I was concerned. I've never seen anything like this before. But he's doing this work, so I'm just sitting on the ground in the dirt, playing around, and then uh, he stopped, uh, got from behind the reins, I assumed to go relieve himself in the woods. So I'm thinking, okay, here's my chance uh, to impress my grandfather. So as soon as he disappeared in the woods, I got up, I went up, I had no idea what I was doing, and I was a, a young teenager at the time, and so it was really hard for me to even pick the plow up because that thing was heavy. And I don't know how, what you all know about a horse and a plow. I, I assume not much, but, but uh, you know, you have a horse and they have uh, these uh, reins that come back and a chain, a thing called a single tree that hooks into the plow. And, and there's a trick to lean the plow one way or the other to get it going straight. Uh, and I, knew, I didn't know any of that at the time. So I get the plow up, I get the reins behind me, and I knew how to make the horse start walking. So the horse starts walking. Uh, unfortunately, the horse is walking completely diagonal across my, my grandfather's perfectly straight road. Now, let me caveat this with uh, things are a lot different today than they were then. Um, let me just get right to the point. Whipping your kids back then was not a problem. And, 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 I, and I knew that and nobody would take you to jail if you, if you did. So I, I knew that. Uh, and so that's the first thing that went through my mind because, gen and he had never disciplined me that way before, but I knew that he could, and I think I knew that he would if he needed to. Um, so I always tried to avoid that. But I also knew the disciplinary tool of choice then was a switch. Uh, and, and those of you that uh, have parents were probably told you back in the day, they would actually make you go get your own switch, you know, which kind of added insult to injury. I'm not recommending that today now, so I want to be clear. <laughs> I'm going to be clear. But that's the way it was. It, it, it just, that's just the way it was. So uh, I'm thinking about, oh, my God, this is awful. So this horse is going. He's, he's really walking fast. I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up. I don't know what to do. Uh, he's, he's about, you know, my, my grandfather eventually runs out of the woods, and I'm almost, almost all the way across the field now trying to keep up with this horse. So he came out, and he yelled, Larry, what are you doing? And, and I instinctively tried to turn around to see him, and the horse, though, didn't stop. And so I, I started to stumble, and as I caught my balance, I, you know, to my, I said, whoa. Then, of course, the horse stopped. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that's what you need to say to make the horse stop. Uh, so he comes charging toward me. I'm thinking, OK, this is it. Uh, all the, there's a lot of trees around here. Uh, this is it. Nobody's out here, no witnesses. So this, 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 this is not going to go well. So he came up to me. The first thing he asked me was, I OK? And I'm thinking, well, I wasn't expecting quite that reaction. So I said, yes, I'm, I'm OK. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I was just, and he stopped me. Uh, and he said something that, uh, that was not very profound uh, in its articulation, but I think it was profound in its meaning, something that I've used my, my whole life and my whole career. Uh, and he said, it's, he said, it's, he said it's, it's, it's okay to try and fail, but it's not okay not to try. Now, you can say that more articulately, uh, and I'm sure philosophers would say it a different way. But that really stuck with me, that it's OK for me to try something, and it's OK if I'm not successful. But it's not OK to sit on the sidelines and don't try. Uh, and that's really, uh, that's guided me uh, my entire life. Because those of you that know me, I, I don't know, most of you don't, I know one does, um, would, will tell you, you, don't, you want me to do something? Tell me I can't do it. You don't, you don't want me to, you don't, you don't think I'm going to get a, the next promotion? Tell me I'm not going to get the next promotion. That's the way I've been my whole life. And have I failed some? Absolutely. Uh, but I always got up. Uh, and I always tried. And if I made a mistake, I learned from it. Try not to make that mistake again, 
but that wasn't going to stop me from trying. So, so please understand that, you know, you, all of you in this room, most of you have on uniforms or, or not, you can be su as successful as you want to be. The but is, I'm, and I'm just going to be honest with you, there's a lot of haters out there that are going to tell you what you can't do. Now, I gotta, I'll just give you my own experience. When I was enlisted, I was told there's no way you can be an officer. Not going to happen. Just, you, you just, you're just not officer material. When I was an officer, uh, particularly, so I, I came up in the financial management career field in the Air Force. And most of you know in the Air Force, most of those that make it to the top are pilots. That's just the way it is. And I'm not saying that's wrong, necessarily. That's just the way it is. So folks told me, and I, and I had a, I remember when I was a major, I had a C-130 pilot come up to me and say, uh, what do you think about your chances of making lieutenant colonel? I said, I don't know. They, I guess they're as good as anybody else's. And he said to me, well, you'll be really lucky if you make lieutenant colonel, but if you do, you're certainly not going any higher than that. Okay. As recent as a three-star general, I'm a three-star general on the joint staff in the Pentagon. And I was told that, you know, boy, you've really exceeded all expectations. You're a three-star, but there's no way they're going to make anyone who is not a pilot a four-star. Just not going to happen. Uh, I was told these things my entire career, and what they didn't know is all it did was fuel me to prove them wrong. And you can prove people wrong. So, you know, I, if I could trade places with you right now, I would absolutely do it. Uh, you know, my career and my life, more importantly than my career, uh, has been uh, something that I could not have scripted. Uh, I could not have written it down, written it any better. I could not have uh, mapped it uh, any better than it's gone. I was never one to sit back and plot, I need this assignment next, I need this training next, I need to do that to be able to get here. Uh, the best advice, and I'll leave you with this and see if you have any questions, the best advice I ever got, which I followed when I was a, actually a second lieutenant, was that I should bloom where I'm planted. And that means that we should do the best job we can right now where we are today. That's all we can control. And if you do that, everything else will take care of itself. Uh, that's my advice to you because someone gave me that advice and it was some of the best advice I ever had, just to bloom where you plant it. Wherever you are today in life, if you're in school, if you're in the military, if you're, if you're in a civilian capacity, do the absolute best job you can do right now and the rest will take care of itself. Okay, again, thank you all for what you are doing. Uh, and I really appreciate everything you're doing. When you walk through an airport in a uniform and someone, a fellow American says, thank you for your service, they really believe it. They really believe it. So thank you for your service. Any, any questions, any other questions or any comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you are aware that Air Force beat Navy, right? <laughs> oh, okay. I just, I, in case you didn't, weren't aware of that, I just want to make sure you knew that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, sir, clearly you're motivated, um, but my question for you is, did you have any mentors as you arrived at Delta? Uh, was it the officer? Great question. And if so, could you elaborate on any of those Great, great question. Um, so, absolutely. I had so many mentors that, that I can't name them all. The trick is, what, do you, what is a mentor? And I think there are different types of mentors. So. So I had mentors, for example, who, who th that were very um, overt, very obvious. They, they, for whatever reason, they saw some potential in me. They came to me and said, look, I, you know, I, I like what you're doing. I want to try to help you. Uh, here's my card. You know, here's my number. Uh, let's get together for lunch. You know, let's talk about your career. So that was sort of the traditional mentorship relationship. I had, but I had other mentors, though. Uh, who, who did not know they were mentors. 
and, and because I would identify someone that I thought was really doing a great job, who was really a great leader, uh, and I watched them. Not that I wanted to be like them, because leadership, having a mentor is not copying someone, but it's learning from them the way, the way they solve problems, the way they lead, and then within your own personality and your own leadership skills, growing your own leadership. Not, again, not, I, I want to lead just like this person. Uh, I'll give you an example of one that you, you probably know. Uh, I'm trying to think of what rank I was, uh, but I was it, was, it was during, I think I was a, a major, and uh, I was at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina, and we were gearing up for Desert Storm, and it, I mean, it, you know, I could talk about Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom, for that matter, all day long. Uh, but we were gearing up for the war. And, you know, people were on TV, had the president on TV, had all these hot rollers on TV uh, making statements. And a four-star general came up on the screen. Uh, his name was General Colin Powell. And I looked at that guy, and I said, oh, my God. Th this guy is sharp. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. He commands the crowd. Uh, he is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. How in the world did that happen? So I, I went and looked up his bio. I, started, I, I, I read about his story. You know, his parents coming from, immigrating from Jamaica, him growing up in New York, not being a very good student in a small college in New York, to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and so I started watching him and listening to him. I've gotten to meet him several times since then. Uh, but I had a lot of mentors like that uh, that, I, that I sort of watched and tried to learn from. Some knew it, some didn't. Of course, as I mentioned up front, uh, my sort of foundational mentors were people like my father and uh, you know the NCOs that I got to grow up with uh, growing up. So very important, though, to have mentors all types of mentors, both in your military chain of command and outside. Because a lot of times, you want to you talk to someone, but you don't want anyone in your chain of command to know about it. You're just trying to, you know, you're just trying to vent sometimes. You, you know, you just need, you need someone to talk to. By the way, um, one of the lessons you will learn as you progress in your career is when you're junior in rank, you know, I used to have a, when I was the vice chief, I would have into my office, occasionally I would have, a, I had several groups. I would have young airmen in, I would have senior NCOs in, and I would have company grade officers in. And it was interesting to talk to the company grade officers, the captains, not Navy captains, but <laughs> Air Force captains, uh, because I know what they do and I know what I did as a captain. As a captain, they sit around and talk about the boss. The, the problem is once you become the boss, you are the one being talked about. And so I think it's really important to understand that the higher you, you progress in not only grade in the military, but in uh, responsibility if you're a civilian, the lonelier it gets. And all of a sudden, you find yourself as a boss, as a commander, as a leader, and you can't, there's nobody for you to sit around and talk about. People are sitting around talking about you. And so, again, a couple of valuable things in that for me. One is, how you, the, 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 the saying, how you stand depends on you, where you sit, is completely true. Because if you're, if you're in a, a point in the organization where, uh, you know, you, you don't have a lot of experience and you don't really understand the big picture, it's easy for you to say, if I were there, I would do this. Or they don't know what they're doing, because, but, but when I get there, I'm going to do it differently. And we all say that until we get there. And we say, wait a minute, this is harder than I thought it was. And the challenges here are, are more difficult than I thought they were. Um, so I think that's why it's important to have a mentor, it, it, one of the reasons why. It, I don't care where you are, what your career is or where you are, there's going to be occasions where you need someone that you can talk to in private, uh, can talk to in confidence, uh, and, and, and someone who would be honest with you and not tell you what you want to hear. Uh, so big, good question. That's, uh, for me, uh, I'm not sure where I would be uh, without good mentors. So it looks like I'm getting a hook here. 
Um, so, so anyway, th again, thank you all so much for what you're doing. Seriously. Um, you are the future of our country. Um, you are our the, the leaders of, future leaders of our country. You all will go on to do, I know, great things. Um, please understand your responsibility. Uh, embrace it. Uh, and remember this, if nothing else. It's okay to try and fail, but it's, it's not okay not to try. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.